Our gospel lesson for today comes from Luke chapter 24, verses 36b through 48. Jesus himself stood among them and said to them, Peace be with you. They were startled and terrified and thought that they were seeing a ghost. He said to them, Why are you frightened and why do doubts arise in your hearts? Look at my hands and my feet. See that it is I myself. Touch me and see. For a ghost does not have flesh and bones as you see that I have. And when he had said this, he showed them his hands and his feet. While in their joy they were disbelieving and still wondering, he said to them, Have you anything here to eat? They gave him a piece of broiled fish, and he took it and ate it in their presence. Then he said to them, These are my words that I spoke to you while I was still with you, that everything written about me in the law of Moses, the prophets, and the Psalms must be fulfilled. Then he opened their minds to understand the scriptures, and he said to them, Thus it is written that the Messiah is to suffer and to rise from the dead on the third day, and that repentance and forgiveness of sins is to be proclaimed in his name to all the nations, beginning from Jerusalem. You are witnesses of these things. This morning we read of a case of mistaken identity. Our lectionary reading picks up in the middle of a story. In Luke's Gospel, this is still the day of resurrection, Easter. Just prior to our reading is a wonderful encounter that two of Jesus' followers experienced. Let me summarize the event for you. Cleopas and his friend were traveling on the road to Emmaus, and they were discussing all that had taken place over the last few weeks. As they were discussing these things, the risen Jesus came up to them and began to walk with them, but the scripture says they were not able to recognize who he was. It's only when they invite him to stay at their home and to have supper with them, and he takes the bread, blesses it, breaks the bread, only then, in that moment, do they recognize him. And in the next moment, Jesus disappears. So Cleopas and the other men run back to Jerusalem to tell the 11 disciples what had happened. And as they are telling this story to the disciples of all that took place, suddenly Jesus appears. This is where we came into the story. Jesus appears right in the midst of them. Again, they don't immediately recognize him. On the contrary, they are all startled and frightened because they think they're seeing a ghost. Now, why is it that no one recognizes Jesus right off the bat? Earlier that morning in the garden, Mary needed to hear Jesus say her name out loud before she realized he was not the gardener. Later in the upper room, the disciples needed to see his wounds. And the two men on the road to Emmaus needed to see Jesus break the bread in order to recognize him. Now as he stands before them, Jesus says, Look at me. Look on my hands and feet and see that I have flesh and bones. Touch me. I'm no ghost. Why did they mistake Jesus for a ghost or disembodied spirit? And why didn't anyone recognize him? especially Cleopas and the other person who were just telling the disciples they had seen Jesus. There is something that plays a factor in these situations. Think about what they're going through. Their rabbi had just been executed in the most horrific way and danger is looming. It's possible that the followers of Jesus might be in jeopardy from the authorities as well. Hanging in the air all around them is a sense of fear and gloom. When Jesus appears to those gathered in the room, we read that they were startled and terrified. Jesus then says to them, don't be afraid. Fear is a common human response to the unknown. For the disciples, it was now a fear of the future. Their world had turned upside down. Their leader had been crucified and those who followed him closely now feared for their own lives. What would their future hold? It was fear that kept the followers of Jesus from recognizing him. 
Fear blinds us. It blinds us from seeing the positive possibilities by blocking our vision with the negative ghosts that haunt us. The disciples had a fear of being found out. They were hiding in a room behind locked doors, and their worst fear suddenly had come true. They had been discovered. A stranger stood among them. And worst of all, this stranger apparently is a ghost. That's what fear does to us. It makes the worst imaginations of our minds come to life. Fear keeps us from seeing the good in our lives. It blocks our vision, and we miss the good that is right in front of us. Science today tells us that the fight-or-flight reaction to fear causes a physiological reaction that occurs in the presence of danger or even perceived danger. The body releases hormones that cause all kinds of reactions in our body. These were meant to help us in a fight or to help us flee from danger. But if we are doing neither of these, the hormones remain in our bodies, and so fear is not released in fight or flight. This can cause stress and damage to our bodies. Fear can keep us from seeing Jesus as he is, the risen and reigning Lord of all. If fear can keep us from seeing Jesus properly, then we won't recognize that Jesus has the power in our lives to overcome all adversity. Fear keeps us in bondage and trapped behind locked doors. We live in a time of great fear and anxiety, as did the early disciples. For the last year, we have literally been hiding behind doors for fear of a virus. But there are other locked doors in our lives, figuratively speaking, fears that keep us locked away from the victorious life that God wants us to have. There are many fears that people have in common. Fear of illness, fear of losing a job or not finding a job, fear of being alone, fear of death. Fear is a prison that would keep us locked behind closed doors. But Jesus has broken the bonds of fear and death. We no longer need to be afraid of anything. The bonds of death could not hold Jesus, and those same bonds will not hold us because we belong to him. Jesus breaks the bonds of fear. Jesus broke through and dispelled the fear hanging over the disciples. He appeared to them in the midst of their fears and questions. They were hiding, filled with fear of the authorities, and trying to figure out the meaning behind all these strange reports and sightings. And suddenly, in the midst of all this, Jesus appears. They're startled, they're scared, they think they see a ghost. Even though they've heard the accounts of the women at the tomb and the two from Emmaus, they're still not prepared to see Jesus standing right in front of them. Their natural response is fear. Now, I find it so reassuring that Jesus doesn't chastise them. He doesn't say, shame on you, you shouldn't be afraid. Instead, he offers them peace. He assures them there's nothing to be frightened of, and he encourages them to move beyond their fears and to put away their doubts. Jesus meets them in the midst of their fears and offers himself to them. Look at my wounds. He says, touch me. And then he begins to eat. Quite frankly, I don't think Jesus needed sustenance. This was Jesus reassuring them that what they saw was real. This was Jesus moving them beyond their fear and disbelief to see the impossible become possible, to witness that the dead has come to life and to see that God is capable of transforming even death to life. Their fears are washed away as they rejoice in Jesus. Joy replaces fear. Jesus conquered the fear in the disciples when he spoke peace to them. Every time that Jesus appeared to someone after the resurrection and they were frightened, he said, peace be with you. Now this is more than just an inner peace of the heart. The Hebrew word shalom speaks of a quality of life that is rich and fruitful. It is wholeness of life. 
that is found living as God's new creation. Jesus offers that wholeness of life found in his peace. How do we get that peace? When Jesus offers peace to the disciples, he tells them, look at me. That's the key to finding this peace. Look at Jesus. When we turn our eyes away from our fears and focus instead on the resurrected Jesus, then we find we have hope. And that hope brings us joy. When we focus on the resurrection and the hope that it brings for our salvation, we rejoice. Jesus says, look at me and you will have peace. We look to Jesus and we look on Jesus because his resurrected body is the centerpiece of our faith. With the resurrection of Jesus, we have forgiveness of sin. We have new life in Christ today and we have hope of our eternal future with him. Paul tells us, set your mind on things above, not on earthly things. That's what happens when we look on the resurrected Jesus. We look to Jesus and the fear of our circumstances will flee. God is in control. What have we to fear? Yes, there are circumstances that threaten to bring fear into our lives, but we don't have to let the fear win. If we keep our eyes on Jesus and keep the joy of our faith, then fear won't get the best of us. Nehemiah 8.10 reminds us, the joy of the Lord is your strength. If we're facing a trial, that's when we need our strength the most. Fear chases away joy, and when we lose our joy, we lose our strength. When fear attempts to creep in, that's when we need to set our eyes on Jesus and begin to rejoice that he is risen. And not only that, we know that we too will one day be raised like him. As that great hymn says, made like him, like him we rise. The secret of keeping fear at bay is to look at the risen Christ and praise God for all that he's done in your life and for all that he will do in your life. We need to remind ourselves that God is in control and he already has the victory. Look to Jesus, the author and finisher of our faith. Focus on the risen Christ and our fears and discouragements will be replaced by joy. Now I know sometimes we won't feel like doing this. Sometimes it's very difficult to feel like rejoicing in the midst of sorrow and pain. It took the disciples a while to come around. It's not always easy to rejoice. That's why in Hebrews we read that we are to offer up the sacrifice of praise. A sacrifice is something that isn't easy. A sacrifice is something we have to give up. But as we begin to praise God, our joy will return. A thankful heart brings joy. And what does joy do? The joy of the Lord is your strength. It's like smile science, as I call it. I once heard that just by smiling, we can make ourselves feel better. You see, making the muscles in our face take the form of a smile will cause our bodies to release endorphins. So go ahead, try it right now. Smile. Even if you don't feel like it, smile. And see if you don't start feeling just a little bit better. It's the same way with looking to Jesus and praising God. Even if everything seems to be going against you and fear is creeping in on you, even if you don't feel like it, look to Jesus and praise God. See if you don't begin to feel a little bit better and have a better attitude about your situation. Paul was in prison when he wrote, Rejoice in the Lord always. I'll say it again. Rejoice. Fear is bondage. If the disciples had remained behind those locked doors, the good news about the risen Christ would never have made it to other people. Can you imagine how different this world would be if the gospel had never been shared? But once their fear was banished and they rejoiced in Jesus, freeing them to go out 
and share the good news that Jesus Christ is risen. The last words of this passage today move the disciples out into the world. You are witnesses of these things. There is power in our faith. There is power in the risen Christ and there is power in the Holy Spirit. Power to transform our lives and the world. We have the reason for hope. We know what it is. Jesus is risen. We have hope. We have peace. We have joy. Jesus says to us, be my witnesses of this. We are to look to Jesus and take this hope and joy out into a world that is broken and lost and trapped by fear. We are to help dispel fear with the power of Christ and the hope of the resurrection from the dead. Yes, tragedies will happen. Yes, people are in despair. And yes, death will come. But God has the final word. God is the final word because Christ is risen. He is risen indeed.